Well, it seems like it's been forever since camp ended, and, uh, and it's been just, just a week. Well, actually, Sunday, we, we headed out from camp, and uh, it's, it's always a, a weird feeling being the, the last ones out the door, and it, when you leave, it's just no one else is there. They, they've all left and gone home, but it's, uh, it's always a, a lot of stress building up to it, a lot of planning, and then uh, a ton of joy to, to work together with, with everyone in, in, in these kinds of a settings. Uh, you know, many thoughts have been going through my head this week as we've reflected on uh, all that we experienced as, as staff and campers uh, at our particular camp at Camp Athens. Uh, and I, I'd like to talk about some of those today, a, a bit of a recap. I, I, I gave a message to the staff before camp started and, and had a few thoughts and those, those thoughts uh, I'll share today. But for those of you that were there and heard that message, I'll, I'll hit it from several different angles uh, today than I, than I did uh, two Sabbaths ago. The, uh, I don't know if it, it, it's difficult for me to describe the teen camp experience for, for, to someone who's never attended or, or or as a camper or as a staff member before. It's just, it's a different kind of world. You're, you're, so, uh, you're so packed in with one another and you're so close to interacting with one another through the, through the week. You just, you just don't get that kind of experience except if it's uh, you know, a situation like we've done here with the congregation where we've, you know, we've all gone on a ski trip and, and this group is here in this little, this little condo or, or we're on the camp out and we're all with one another uh, for a week like we do in Colorado or, or a situation where you're at camp. You're very close to others, you're in, in especially the campers, they're, they're in the same dorm with these people <laughs> interacting on every single level and you get to know a lot about a person when you're right there doing everything with them. For, uh, for, for the next seven days. But, but in that, it's, it's, it's just so neat as a, as a director standing back, and I, and I would think for most of our staff as well, that work individually with these young people to see the, the little victories uh, that they experience, to see the little challenges and sometimes the big challenges that they experience, to watch them uh, interact in situations where it's not easy. You know, some, some settle in right away and, and they know all these people and they've connected with them uh, from, from previous years and they're right there at camp and, and together again and it's, it's just so easy and, and free flowing. And others, it's a struggle, it's a challenge to, to try to figure out how, how am I going to find my way and, and be in this situation with these people that I don't know well, and, and will I fit in? Will I, will I get through the week? Can I handle the challenges that I'm, I'm going to be facing? All these things uh, go through uh, people's minds. I, I saw a, a ton of successes uh, this past week, and I think what probably, well, several things impressed me. One is the degree of dedication that the staff has to, to give up their time to come and do that for a full week, and, and as, as Mr. Jones talked about in the sermonette, that decision to understand what it is to sacrifice for others and, and to take joy in that. It is a, it is a sign of maturity and it's, it's a sign of, of a, a very demonstrable uh, way to, to show that a, a, a person is, is converted, that a person really is putting others' needs ahead of, uh, of their own needs. And it's a beautiful thing to behold. But, I, I love seeing a kid catch fire on, on something, and, and we saw that uh, several times this week. In, in one, issue, uh, one situation, there, there was a kid who was there with us from the Czech Republic who, had, uh, who played pickleball for the first time. And he, he started realizing that he's got, he's got the kind of forehand that he could drive that ball. And, and, and once he started developing that skill, it was like any f bit of free time that he had, he was there at pickleball and he was focused on, on every, just seeing, seeing the excitement and, the, and uh, the, the joy that he got out of developing a skill and, and having some mastery uh, was a neat thing. I really appreciated uh, seeing those that, are, uh, that went for the Bible challenge this year to, to know the books of the Bible in order, to know the holy days and their meanings and to know the Ten Commandments uh, in order and, and to, to work through that. Kids that maybe struggled athletically but, uh, but demonstrated through their knowledge and it's a testament to the way their parents have worked with them that they can come and, and, and set 
as fine example as they did. But nothing, nothing inspires me as much as though as, as seeing them sit in the classes, seeing them interact, seeing them uh, in question and answer sessions in the dorm, uh, ask the kinds of questions that that demonstrate uh, some depth, some depth of understanding, some. Uh, that they really are thinking about what's going on in the world around them, what, how, how they should live, how they should handle these situations in a, in, in a godly way. Uh, there was a, our, uh, our youngest uh, boys' dorms counselor. Uh, so basically we're talking about 12- and 13-year-olds, a few 14-year-olds. We had three boys' dorms uh, this year. But uh, he had uh, these, these five guys in his dorm that he termed that they were the brain trust. And uh, these five guys, man, they, they had so much going on in, in their minds. I remember uh, I was there for the, let's see, it was the, the Wednesday night study. Was it the Wednesday night? No, it was, no, no, it was a Monday night. I was there with the Monday night study. And they were just asking me these questions. I mean, it was in depth. I was like, man, I, I've got to get to work here. I've got to think, 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 think. Don't mess this up. But uh, great questions, great insights. Uh, and, and then I, uh, I was swinging by. It was a Friday evening uh, before dinner. No, no, it was Sabbath. It was Sabbath afternoon after services. Uh, we had gotten casual again, and we were going to go down to, going to, go down to, to the dining hall for dinner. But... Uh, they, they waved me down and stopped, and uh, the assistant counselor was there uh, helping, and he said, uh, the guys have some, some questions for you, and I said, oh, okay, all right. I was in my shorts. I didn't have my sword of the spirit with me, and I was thinking, oh, we've got to get really focused here, but uh, so anyway, so the, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the complete brain trust, but I think it was three or four of them were there, but they, they started asking me questions, and they they asked about Solomon. What, what do you think is going to be the outcome of Solomon? You think of, of and they, they're, they're telling me this, you know, the decisions that he made with falling into idolatry, yet, yet we see what he, what he writes in Ecclesiastes, and, and uh, what, what do you think is going to happen to him? So anyway, we, we, we talked about that a little bit, and one of them said, I really hope that he turned and repented like David did. Uh, that, that's my hope, and I thought, yeah, that's my hope too. But, uh, th then, but then, uh, then we went to Daniel 12. They wanted to go through Daniel 12, and we had to start going into the 1335 days and the 1290 days and the 1260 days. It got pretty heavy, brethren. Uh, so, but just a, a really, a really neat, neat bunch of guys. And again, as, as I said, it, it, speaks to, it speaks to the degree to which uh, families are talking about God's way of life. And again, I'm not, I'm not indicating that you as a parent are really failing uh, if your child is not talking to you about the 1335 days and what exactly that means in, in reference to Christ. But, but we, we all have our different ways of, 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 of working and, and teaching and, and, and living God's way of life. But uh, it's very inspiring uh, to me. This year, of course, the the theme was running the race and obtaining the prize, as is talked about in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. We won't, we won't turn there, but so many different uh, concepts were addressed by our instructors this year that I, that I, I felt uh, merited my sharing a few of those things with you today, as well as some thoughts uh, that, that I had had as well. You know, when we look at the Olympics as they're going right now, it's perfect timing to cover this running the race and obtaining the prize and seeing all that goes on with the Olympics. I've got to admit, I have not seen the Olympics this year. I have wanted, wanted to do that, but it seems like the, four years ago, camp fell about that, that same, uh, same time. Or what, wait, wait, four years ago was 2020. We didn't have camp. I don't know what, I, uh, I don't remember watching much of the Olympics four years ago. And I didn't watch much this year. I was telling Sherman, the only thing that I saw, I, I saw like a snapshot of a person who fell with a really serious injury in the steeplechase. So I, I saw that. And then I saw that uh, it, He's got a, a different kind of name, but he was in the uh, he was in the pommel horse for the uh, uh, United States team, and he needed and that's the only thing that he did. And he wore these glasses that were so thick because he couldn't see very well, but he had to take his glasses off. But they said the pommel horse, you just he just he knows it so well. It's his only event, but he just he feels his way around that. And 
and he needed to stick it uh, in order for them to, to meddle, and he stuck it. You know, he just got after it, and to see the excitement and joy that uh, the, the U.S. team had to be able to secure a medal uh, was really neat. So uh, after sunset and when uh, when YouTube starts becoming really prolific with all the different uh, events, I, I think I'll get caught up. But, uh, but that's going on, and, and we've got many races in the Olympics. And as uh, Scripture says, in, in these kinds of races, only one, only one wins and, and gains, the, gains the prize. But he tells us to all run the race that we might obtain the prize. How many races are going on right now in, in society? How many races are we experiencing? How many races have we seen this past week? I'd like to talk about some of those races. I, I'd like to quote from uh, this week's, actually this week's uh, president's letter or member letter that we received, I think it was August 8th when it was written. And, and this one is the race for power and dominance. Think about what we see going on in this world. The, 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 critical, the critical thing that Satan is doing, he, he's got the world. He's got the world running a, a different kind of race. In, in, in some respects, he's got the, the world running the rat race. Uh, you know what we mean by the rat race, as idioms.com uh, states, it, it originates from these, these rat cages where they run around in circles and, and they're exhausted and it really goes nowhere in life. And speaking about how so much of what we experience in life is, is this rat race. We're doing so many things and what is it really doing? What is it really accomplishing? We're exhausted, we're, we're worn out, and, and so many of the struggles uh, can, in, in life can be as pointless as, as the actual rat race as where they're given that circular path on which to run. A person who can come out of it, out of the rat race, is considered to be the winner. But uh, we've, got, we've got that kind of race, but the race for power and dominance. I'll, I'll quote from uh, Mr. Mr. Frank's letter, uh, second paragraph. Over the, over the past few work, weeks, I've received letters and emails from a number of members describing the trials they are enduring, health, sickness, family concerns and discouragement and asking for prayers. I, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about Dallas and Sherman right now and how many folks are dealing with issues. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking at some of you folks that are, are dealing with some issues in, in your family. Huge health concerns, have, have gotten through huge health concerns, are, are battling uh, in, incredibly challenging situations. Family, uh, as, as he mentioned as, as well, discouragement, uh, Satan is indeed very active, and more than anything, he'd love to see us simply give up. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this, a this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Today we face the reality of a society and a world gone absolutely mad. Up is declared down, down is declared up, and evil is declared good. It's staggering to see what has happened in the world just since the beginning of the 21st century, less than 25 years ago. It is indeed a spiritual battle that we are fighting, and according to Bible prophecy, it will only get worse. We must be confident in our knowledge that the solutions to this world's problems are primarily spiritual, even though there are often physical problems that need resolution as well. We've got the, the, the physical things that we've got to do to, to function in society, but, but how do we balance all of that? To put our faith in a physical government to change things for the better leads to more discouragement. And then he went through and discussed the, the situation that's going in, on in uh, Venezuela right now. And uh, as he's talked a, a few times before about this, this being the year of the vote, when so many... Uh, potential upheavals uh, in, in various governments around the world because of the number of, of, uh, of situations where there is a, it's coming up for a vote whom the leader, uh, who the leader will be. So he says in, in uh, continuing on, on the second page a bit here, he says, the most common government types 
are, are communist, socialist, democracy, monarchy, constitutional mon monarchy, theocracy, military, dictators, military dictatorship, dictatorship, par parliamentary uh, republic, and various combinations of these systems. Mankind is proving over and over again the wisdom of the proverb written by Solomon, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when a wicked man rules, the people groan. So what is the answer, he writes? I believe we all know the answer. None of man's governments have resolved some of the most basic human problems, and the world is becoming darker with more division, suffering, and tragedy leading to wars, violent uprisings, and starvation. The United States, which has been a beacon of dependable government and peaceful transitions of power for almost 250 years, today stands in the midst of major division and confusion, having lost its moral compass. When, the corrupt, when corruption rears its ugly head, when leaders are selfish and power hungry, the end result is more suffering for the people. We see it virtually everywhere we look in the world today. I also receive a, 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 a publication that is produced by a minister where he uh, gathers various news articles and, and I've quoted from it before, but, uh, but in these gatherings, just, just think about the situation right now with Iran, the situation with the, the proxies and how Iran is, is getting more involved and, and where, where things stand with respect to Israel and here Jerusalem, where Mount Zion stands and all that Jerusalem is this unruly, uncontrollable situation that so many want their hands on that and the power, and it all comes to that. And everything that's 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 going on right now, we as we as we are here today, you know, we, we could hear an announcement that this has happened and this has happened and this and that. It, it could have happened. I don't know. I didn't have the have the radio on. Uh, from the JerusalemPost.com, Netanyahu warns of preemptive attack. Uh, as Tehran speaks of Israel's annihilation. Uh, Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu warned Iran and Hezbollah of preemptive attacks, while Tehran spoke of the Jewish state's annihilation in the region braced uh, for, for the possibility of a second direct confrontation between the two arch foes. We are prepared both defensively and offensively, Prime Minister Netanyahu stated during a visit uh, Wednesday to the IDF induction base at Tel HaShomer. I know that the citizens of Israel are concerned, and I ask one thing of you. Be patient and level-headed, he said. We are striking our enemies and are determined to defend ourselves. Kamala Harris, uh, the uh, current vice president, is open to discussing it, the Israel arms embargo. This is from Newsweek.com. They reported Kamala Harris has said she's prepared to meet with activists to discuss an arms embargo on Israel, according to reports. Uh, we've got our nation is divided in this. Some some think that uh, that that Israel went way too far in the way that they uh, defended themselves after they were attacked. Uh, others in in that same camp will say that that the Palestinians and and the various pro-Palestinian groups and Hamas uh, would not have gone to this point had, had, had Israel not uh, continued to, to press them to this. Others have said, no, they've tried to live as peaceably as possible that they can uh, in, 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 these, in all these times, and yet the, the other side is, is still only wanting the annihilation of Israel. And it's just, it, it's constant. And then we see our country divided. We see... Uh, Wondering, you know, how with the next leader, whoever that is, if that's uh, Kamala Harris or, or Donald Trump, you know, who, what, what will happen then? Who, what kind of stance will we take in that situation? What will happen with respect to the way that uh, we we generate our economy? Uh, all all of these things are are in the works. United States, according to JerusalemPost.com, uh, they they report the United States sent additional warships to the Middle East that are capable of defending against missiles amid an increase in tensions between Israel and Iran. Uh, subbing out uh, the, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt uh, to be replaced by the Abraham, USS Abraham Lincoln. I've also ordered uh, more and more 
Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said, I've also ordered more cruisers and destroyers capable of ballistic missile defense to that region. Russia uh, is delivering advanced air defenses to Iran at its request, according to Israel National News. Pakistan announces its intention to supply arms to Iran at the OIC meeting. Uh, the United States is, is uh, naval presence is, is setting up in, in case of possible retaliation. Egypt has said, according to Israel National News, they won't help defend against an Iranian attack. Uh, Israel, Israelis brace for a thousand rocket multi-proxy attack as uh, Jerusalem Post talks. It, it, it's so many things, so many things. We're, we're inundated and almost we by it and we're almost numb to it that, that this is happening uh, the way it is. But the race for world power, how is China uh, trying to gain control of uh, and buying land in so many of those areas around, the countries around, gaining influence, Russia's influence, uh, North Korea aligned with them, all these different things that are happening uh, to, for the purpose of gaining uh, power and dominance. You know, we think about the wars and the rumors of wars that Scripture talks about happening. It, we're in that. We're in that time, and and it's and 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 then we even lead to the, the time of the seven trumpets, which we we talk about on the Feast of Trumpets, and the seven last plagues, and the, the rallying of the armies to to fight one another, to come together and and fight at Jerusalem, only to turn and fight uh, Jesus Christ. These things are real, and and we see this going around us. Uh, and, and the races that Satan, the devil, the God of this world, the, the one the, who, uh, with whom we're in battle, uh, is, is striving to cause, uh, and, it, and it's so challenging uh, for God's people as, as we live in this world, and we see the kinds of things that are going on. And, 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 and you know, we're all, we're all, we're all our own people, too, and, and we have some thoughts about some things. If I were in this position, I don't think I'd be doing it that way. I'd be doing, I mean, we, we, have those, we have those thoughts. We, we have things that we see uh, that where certain things align more to, to how we would think it, would, it, it should need to be. Uh, I've, I've dealt with uh, back problems the last two weeks, and I'm, I'm just now to where if I stand up long enough, it eases up and I'm fine, but if I sit down, I get really stiff. And uh, I've told people that uh, if, if I sit down for very long, I, I'm bent over and I'm leaning to the right, but that's not a political statement. Uh, but it's, it's been, it's amazing how so many uh, situations are going on and we see it as, as we've talked ad nauseum about how it can, it can rise up uh, in, within the church and, and become this uh, hotbed of, of discussion that is really not productive because of, of the, the kinds of things that we see, as, as was talked about in the member letter, they're, they're just not fixable. They're not fixable. Satan wants us to get involved in those races, to think on those races, and to think about the, the, the nuances of, you know, if sh should, should Trump uh, go up against uh, Kamala Harris in, in a debate, uh, how will that do, will, will he, if, if people are pulling for Trump, you know, will he be able to keep from saying all these things that, that he can tend to say that can uh, do, do him worse harm than, than just saying what his position is? Uh, can she stand up against him? Would it be smart for her to even go into that uh, situation? What about the two vice presidents? Let's put them up uh, head to head with one another. Who's going to win? Who's going to win if we, if we have that? And, and how's that going to influence the vote? And all of that. I mean, those, those of you and those of us that see those kinds of news events, we know that's, that's the rage. That's, that's what we're talking about right now in, in, in our country. And yet, uh, that's not the race, is it? That's not the race uh, in which we have uh, engaged to run. Let's go to 2 Timothy 4 as we get into things here today. 2 Timothy 4, you know, we, we, we ask ourselves, I, I ask myself as I, as I see these kinds of things, I ask myself as, as I deal with the things that I deal with in, in my life and the, the battles and the challenges and the time, the time consumers and, and the things that I've got to do as, as you've got to do your kinds of things to, to function. But 
I, I have to continually ask myself, and I, I know I've said this a few times, but I, I think it's so critical for us in, in the days and months ahead. Do, do, do we, do I, do you, do you really want what God wants? Do, are we really aligned with what God wants? Uh, have we, ha, are we counting the cost, uh, or are we reflecting back on how we did count the cost of what it is to be his disciple? What it is to say, I am for you, God. I am for you taking control of this situation and for you bringing your kingdom to this earth. I, I am for that. You do that how you need to do that. I am a servant who I, whom I hope will, you will find uh, so doing when you come and, and so doing and so engaged in the race that uh, the master wants us uh, to, to be a part of. I, I think about this passage, and this one has always uh, intrigued me a bit. I've read different thoughts on this, and I, I don't know that we can say we know exactly uh, what the situation was, but it's in 2 Timothy 4. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, as, as Paul's talking about his race, is, is uh, coming to an end. I have finished the race. I've, I've kept the faith. He's fought the good fight. But then he says in verse 9, he makes this statement, be diligent, he says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 verse 9, be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for uh, Thessalonica, Thessalonica, uh, Crescens for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. For, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this, this present world. Uh, it talks in Colossians, I believe it is Colossians 4, that discusses uh, at, at a different time when Demas, if this is the same Demas, was, was alongside him and working and helping him uh, in, in a variety of uh, different ways. But uh, some of the commentaries have discussed, well, why, why did this happen? And what was the nature of, of this having loved this present world? And again, I don't, I don't think they can, they can say definitively. Some have thought that some of the persecution was so severe, and even, even by uh, the Jews, and uh, the situation that, that Paul had been placed where his life was at, uh, such, in such peril so many different times that Demas needed to step away from that and, and just could not... Could not <laughs> give himself fully to saying, okay, I'm, I'm in this with Paul, and, and my life is, is your life, God, and if, if this happens to me, so be it. And, and he stepped away, not that he necessarily left the faith, but, but that other things pushed up enough to where he, he checked out. Uh, I don't know if it's that. I, I don't know if it, if it was. He completely gave himself over to the ways of the world in, in every way, but but he says he, he, did, uh, he did love, uh, having loved this, this present world, having loved this present world. And so I wonder, I wonder, and, and it, it makes me think sometimes the degree, what, what do I love about this present world? Is there anything that I love about this present world, the, the, the creature comforts that we have, the, the, the AC, <laughs> the, the, the health that, that we enjoy, the food. What, what is it? Uh, is there anything that, that uh, relationships, do I value relationships so much that I'm willing to compromise on, uh, on something for the sake of, of, of saving a, a relationship, compromise on what is right? Uh, all of those things go through my mind as I, as I think about this Demas and what it was that caused him to fall away. 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, verse, verse uh, actually, let's go to 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. You know, I mentioned before about the, this, this race for the White House and how our, our country is so uh, caught up in that, and with uh, with President Biden now uh, not seeking re-election uh, due to a variety of reasons, and, and how that all came about, and people looking to try to figure out how how are these different folks going to position themselves? Why didn't why didn't Kamala Harris pick Shapiro, 
who was a Jew, which could also have really helped her gather these numbers here, uh, where uh, uh, Walls could not grab that kind of uh, those kinds of numbers that that she could grab. You know, all this stuff goes on, all all this discussion, and. And I think about all this, I, I think about the way that our, our nation is so caught up in this because they see, they see the need to have somebody save this nation. And, and whether it's, it's the Democrats being in control to, to help save our nation or the Republicans, this is what, this is, what is, is on people's minds. Brethren, we know our race does not consist of doing our part to get the correct political power in position in the position that it needs to be. That, that's not our race. That's, that's a race that the God of this world wants us to, in, to engage, to, to fill our minds, uh, to understand. First Timothy 2 speaks to that. First Timothy 2 tells us what we're to do. It tells us what we as, as Christians are to do, how we're to view these things. And, uh, and I have to go back to this passage continually to keep myself in, in, a, in a right frame of mind with all the craziness that we see going on around us. Verse 1 of chapter 2, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, he says, therefore I exhort all of you, you know, encouraging you, build them up to do this. You, you can do this. Now this is what we've got to do. First of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, all these elements of, of reaching out to God and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and all who are in authority. Now, I think about that. Uh, do I do that regularly? Do I, do I pray for, for all of the, the different leaders uh, that are in authority, uh, that are in authority in, in some of these different nations? I'm, I'm not out there. I'm not in contact with folks around the world. I'm not in contact with, with folks in different countries that are in challenging situations as much. We get information from the church uh, about some of the challenges that brethren face, but, but these things are going on. And he says to, to pray for these folks. Pray for what reason? Pray uh, in all who are in authority. These, these people have authority. They, have, uh, they are in uh, prominent places. They are folks that are in charge of things. He says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. That, that, that's showing us, again, the path, as Mr. Jones was saying. It, it shows us the race. Our race is we're striving to live a godly, a, a, a peaceful life in all godliness and reverence, reverence to our God uh, and, and also honoring those who are... Uh, in, in those positions. In, in, in fact, again, verse 1 says, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 3, for this is good. This is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Okay, so that's what I need to be doing. I need to be, be praying like, like Paul instructs us in verses 1 and 2. This is good. This, this is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He has a plan in place uh, to, to, to make this happen. Am I aligned with that? He says, because there is one God. There's one mediator between God and man, the, the man Christ Jesus. <laughs> this individual who gave himself a ransom for all mankind, for all, to be testified in due time. He says, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I, I'm speaking the truth in Christ in this matter. And, and I'm not lying. A, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is my focus, he's saying. This is my mission. This, this is, is the race I'm running. This is where it is. Uh, very important for us as, as we, as, as part of the body of Christ, of which Paul was a part of the body of Christ, think in that same mindset. This is, is our race. 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and, and the things that you have heard from, from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men. We've heard uh, much about this in recent years, about <clears throat> continuing the church in, in going forward and training folks to serve. You, therefore, he says, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 
<clears throat> we are soldiers in this, excuse me, we are soldiers in this, in this battle. We are soldiers in this race. Jesus Christ is the one who has enlisted us. And, and we must not allow ourselves to be entangled by the other races that Satan the devil wants us to race. This is the race you and I are running. We had several uh, split sermons uh, and uh, Christian living classes this week. I won't go through the compass checks. If you would be interested, you can, you can view those. I think uh, Athens is, is, is one of the few that is able to, to uh, project all of those compass checks, these little sermonettes that we have uh, during, during the week at the beginning of each day. Uh, so I won't be commenting on, on those. And we had some, some excellent, uh, excellent ones this past, past, week, past week. But uh, I do want to talk about a couple of the, the split sermons that uh, impacted me and, and I hope also impacted our, our staff and, and campers. Uh, Mr. Nick Slaughter gave a message <clears throat> in, uh, at, at camp the, the, uh, the split sermon message, and he talked about in order to run the race, and you know, again, he's talk, we're talking primarily to the campers here, in order to run the race, this is pretty basic, but this is, but this is deep. Uh, in order to run the race, one must choose to come to the starting line. And there, there are folks that are, uh, are not making the effort to come to the starting line. Uh, we, we've, got, we've got to make that choice. We've got to uh, say, I, I am going to engage in this race. And not only that, I'm going to engage in the right race. But we've got to get to the line. We've got to get to the line and, and get down in the starting position and be prepared to take off. Uh, Mr. Gatley uh, taught a, his, in his Christian living class. He uh, talked about what the race involves. And... I was, the first time I experienced his class, no, actually it was the second time, we were teaching pickleball in the gym, so we had the whole gym, and he had one of the upstairs classrooms, and then all of a sudden, all the, all the kids are coming out of his class, and they're coming down to the floor, right in the middle of where we're teaching. Very distracting, Mr. Gatley, but anyway, uh, but he brought them all down, and, and then he had this stopwatch, and they, uh, they appointed a, a person in each dorm to sprint, to the four corners of the, uh, of the, of the gym and pick up a disc uh, each time. So, you know, I, we're, we're trying to play and then all of a sudden it just, everything stops because they're cheering on this, this kid, guy or girl, whichever dorm, just sprinting down to the corner and, and picking up this disc, sprinting to the other corner. So they did the four corners and then, then they go up to class and I didn't know what they did after that. But anyway, it was very distracting. But, so, but, but I did find out later what it was. He talked about uh, this race, and, and he, timed, uh, he timed each of the dorms. I can't remember which dorm uh, representative won. But, but he talked uh, about the, the race that this individual ran, that each individual ran with, with all of his or her might. And he talked about these four corners or these four pillars in, in running the race. You know, of course, as Mr. Mr. Slaughter uh, discussed, you, you've got to be willing to get to the line. But Mr. Gatley... Uh, talk to our, our campers about recognizing the calling. Do we recognize, as young people, do we recognize that God is reaching out and calling us and, and, and drawing us to him? Uh, secondly, the second corner, we, we've got to come to that state of repentance, that, the state of full repentance of, of not only what I've done, but who I am, my nature, that, that needs to be completely cleansed and, and, and that my direction is is pointed, you know, the repentance is the turning, the, the going in this direction in life. This is my mission. This is my race, is to recognize who I am and what I am and to truly turn and go through the baptism process, the third point, and, and then receive the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. That, that, those are key components, the, the four corners to get us going on that race, to get us going in that direction. Uh, and he, he complimented uh, the campers and the, the way that so many are on that track. Now, again, the, the campers, I, we just had a few that were 18, but uh, most, most are not yet baptized. But he was talking with them about this. This is a calling that's been given, a precious calling that's been given through, through our parents to, to bring us to this knowledge, to give us this, to, to teach us this way of life and, and, and a directional path in life that is so different from what we see going on in the world. So much that ultimately leads to confusion. It's not going to get us anywhere. It only gets us to more suffering and, and, and pain. And 
And yet he's giving us a way of life that is so drastically different that, that sees Jesus Christ as our, as our sacrifice, that, that brings us uh, to, to be a new creation, to go on this path towards ultimately Christ's return. Let's turn to, I don't believe he turned here, but let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2 uh, after it talks about the uh, son of perdition, the false prophet, all that, that he's doing at the end and the deceptions that are there. He comes back to re, reset them on, this, this is where we are. This is our race. This is who we are as the people of God. This is our focus in going forward. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. He says, but we, Paul says, we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, you, you who are the beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you he chose you for salvation through, through sanctification, through being set apart by God's Holy Spirit, by the Spirit and belief in the truth. These, these are pillars. These are, these are things that he's given us. I, I think uh, another, another, uh, another translation or, or the Greek in this has, has another thought. I can't remember where I had found this or, or heard this or read this, but there's an alternative reading that is well supported. This Greek word, I think it's aparchen, A-P-A-R-C-H-E-N, meaning God chose you as first fruits. God, God chose us as first fruits. He calls, caused us to come to understand our, our calling at this time for a purpose that is so far beyond what this world knows. And it's so opposite of what Satan wants us to focus our lives on and going forward. We're to run this race and, and we're to run it together. All run the race. Mr. Dickey uh, talked about that and it, it's not that matter of, of who wins first. It, it's, it's a matter of our running as, as the body of Christ to the finish line and our making it as, as a group. And, uh, is it, is, it all about, is it all about winning, being the first one there, or is it all about, all about us crossing the finish line uh, together because we're running this race together? I, had a, I got a letter from a, a staff member this week uh, that uh, actually it was a Sabbath note. We do Sabbath notes at camp. I think all the teen camps do this. But uh, you know, I, I, I found this... Uh, this letter uh, to be especially inspiring in, in seeing uh, a person uh, catch fire. And he gave me permission to read this, and he may be here uh, today. And as I told Sherman, we're a small enough congregation that it doesn't take an Inspector Clouseau to probably figure out who this individual is. So, uh, but anyway, in, in thinking about all the things that we've got going and, and the race that, that God's people are a part of, I just wanted to read this. And I'll, I'll, I won't read all of it. I'll read some excerpts. But he wrote, he said, I just wanted to thank you for convincing me to be a counselor. The only reason I agreed to it is because I knew you needed me to do it. Uh, he says, uh, then breaking in, he said, for years, and he mentioned a young lady who's also in our congregation, uh, a young lady uh, in our con uh, so this I won't say her name but for years she has tried uh, to convince me to do this but I never thought that I had the patience uh, or skill to do it plus I thought I would be miserable the whole week uh, as as babysitting kids uh, seems so stressful <laughs> anyway he said I was so wrong it is one of the best decisions I've ever made in the weeks leading up to camp I decided to make it at a point to try and make every camper have a better camp experience than, than I was going to experience. And, I had, uh, and I've had some great camp experiences. I learned so much about not only the campers, but I learned about myself too. I feel as if I had a serious conversation with half a dozen of my campers that I'll remember for the rest of my life. From talking about in-depth religion with a 13-year-old, to uh, convincing kids they could ask a girl to dance. Uh, I had a better experience working my, well, he said B-U-T-T, -T, I won't say that word here at church, uh, my, working my backside off uh, for these kids than I had at camp as a camper. 
I had a better experience working my tail off as, uh, for these kids than I had at camp as a camper. That's a neat thing, isn't it? It's a neat thing. And I, I, I think of some of, of my experiences uh, in to, to realize the joy that, that comes with us, as Mr. Jones said, the joy that comes with sacrifice. He said, uh, I just wanted to thank you again for, for everything. And he said, uh, P.S., next year you won't have to convince me to come back. I'll be there. And that is if I accept him. But we'll see about that. But <laughs> no, he, he did a wonderful job. And, and so many of our young people did such a wonderful job. And, and please understand, I'm not saying that unless you go to camp, you don't know what it is to serve. You don't know what it is to give. We have, I'm not saying that at all. We have so many opportunities to give and serve. And I, I think of the, the FOI projects uh, that, that several have done. I, I think of what you guys are doing, uh, guys and gals are doing at, at services and how you help behind the scenes uh, with brethren that are, that are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and we know what that, we know that taste, as Mr. Jones said, that it is, it is a sign of maturity to move into that, that phase of, of really, really wanting to help people and, and helping people and sacrificing to help people. And even getting through the times when we've sacrificed to help people and we pay for it. We pay for it by sometimes people not treating us very well in those situations. Uh, sometimes we get tons of accolades and, and tons of appreciation. Can we continue to sacrifice? Can we continue to serve well? Can we continue to, to run the race uh, that our, our, our coach and master has, has made it, has instructed us to run, that we've gone to the starting line and started, uh, even if we don't get the, the, the pats on the back that, that we think we should for the kind of time that we put in? That, that's maturity as well. And that's what we're striving to do because that's, that's what giving is. But uh, anyway, I, I, was just, I was just really impressed with the way that he, he put this down in writing. And it, and it made me think again of just the, the kinds of things that God is really working with us on, the, the big picture kinds of things. These, these are the kinds of things, that, as, as we've said before, that go on into eternity. The service, the love, the giving, the, the sacrificing, the, uh, the, the serving of, of our master and, and Lord and Savior, all, all of those kinds of things, not, not these other kinds of issues. What is the race? What, what's the name of the event? What are you and I running to obtain? Where's the destination? Where's the finish line? What is the finish line? What is the prize for finishing? It is to become part of the God family. It is to become part of the God family. The prize is to inherit all things. The prize is to step into eternity. Mr. Sandilands, I'll, I'll use this cap, but he used actually the, the head of an eraser off a pencil. He ripped it off, and in his Christian living class, he set it right there at the, the front of, the, of, of his uh, area where he was teaching and he said this little pencil eraser right here is is humanity for the last 6,000 years this and, and somewhere in a part of that little head of the eraser is is our lives our, our human lives here on this earth and he said you go that way and it goes into eternity you go that way and it goes into eternity God the Father and Jesus Christ have always existed into eternity that way. And they are always going to exist into eternity. Satan wants the aberration. He wants us to focus on the little pencil eraser head and all the things that are in it. And so, you know, as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking this is some good stuff for them. Uh, and I was thinking this is some good stuff for me. How much of that, of that little pencil eraser head consumes my life? How, how, how much of those things do I do I let myself fixate upon when God wants us thinking in, in these realms? Because he is, he wants, as, as we said, he wants us to be part of the God family. He's giving us that. He's giving us eternity. Mr. Richard Comadres gave a sermonette this morning in, in, uh, in uh, 
Sh Sherman Van Alstine, just speaking again of, and we've heard messages like this before, I, I love to hear them when he, you begin to talk about the universe and all that it entails. I remember Mr. Evans gave a message at the feast several years ago and just the vast, the vast expanse of, of the universe itself, and yet God says, I'm going to make all things new. What's he going to do with that? That just goes on and on and millions of light years to, to get to where we can even see something. It's just so, so vast, and yet Satan wants us to get all wrapped up in this, this little thing here. And is that not the nature of Satan? That, is, that, is, is that not his situation? So God wants us to run the right race. And the second point that I covered with the staff that I'd, I'd, I'd like to discuss with us, because I'm preaching to myself here, uh, is, is not only... Uh, to, to recognize that we must run the right race and Satan wants us to engage in the other race that is, is so here and gone and all the things that are wrapped up in that is to stay in your lane, bro. Stay in your lane, bro. Mr. Bennett gave a, a sermonette on that. It's one of my favorite things to hear Mr. Bennett say, stay in your lane, bro. I, I thought that was really funny, but anyway, anyway, uh, so so stay. We are to stay in our lane. Where here we got the Olympics, and, and you got to stay in the lane. You you can only step on the line once or twice in some of these long distance races, uh, and you got to get right back in. You, we've got to stay in our lane. And when we think about the nature of the carob that covered, the anointed carob that covered, the one who did not keep his his proper estate, but, but pushed out. He was unwilling to stay in his lane. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, verse 5. And if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. God's given us rules. He's given us so much teaching and instruction. And are we willing to stay in our lane? One of the the most powerful examples that, that I've seen in, in Scripture, besides uh, the one who uh, did only what his father wanted, Jesus Christ, is, is the servant Daniel. I want to just read something about this, Daniel 2. Daniel stayed in his lane. He continued to remain in his lane. You think about the way that God uh, intervened for him and the, the incredible truths and, and prophetic uh, teachings that he gave, you know, from the, the writing on the wall to, uh, to the, the image of gold, the beast, and all these different things, the, the, the teachings of, of what would happen as, as we look at Daniel 11, the intricacies of those prophecies, the things that come up in Daniel 12, the 13, 35 days, the 12, 90, and the 12, 60 days, all of these kinds of things, and yet Daniel stayed in his lane. Daniel realized God was using him for this, and he, he gave credit where credit was due. Let's look at Daniel 2 as they're about to be killed because they can't, nobody knows what the dream was that, that Nebuchadnezzar won't tell them, nor, nor its meaning. So here's Daniel uh, praying, and, and he receives this information. And, and notice how Daniel, how he fixates his what he says, I mean, obviously it's directly saying what God wants him to say here, but, but notice how he, where he gives credit and, and notice his, his confidence and his boldness and his humility as he stayed in his lane. Now, Daniel 2, verse, verse 17, Daniel 2, verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this, this secret that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with all the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So then, verse 19, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel, this is what Daniel did then. He blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the season. He removes kings and raises up kings. Yes, and he does that today, and he will continue to do that. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you, and I praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. 
incredible humility, incredible humility to be delivered this, these truths and, and through that stays in a humble state. And, and as far as we can see through Scripture, he always keeps that mindset. A beautiful, beautiful example of what it is to be a servant of God and to stay in his lane and not go outside that. Moses, the meekest man, he, he got out of his lane. Uh, and, and that lesson is there for us today. Look at verse uh, 36, verse 36 of the same chapter. This is the dream, as he tells Nebuchadnezzar. And look, look at the way he's talking to the most, if not the most powerful human on earth, one of the most, as he's interpreting this for the king. This is the dream, and now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. And how is this so? For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And, and wherever the children of men dwell, where the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you a ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. God's the one who did it. And he was not afraid or fearful to say that it was God who did it to this incredibly powerful person. Look at verse 44. Verse 44, as he ends the, the, the prophecy, he says in verse 44, And in the days of these kings, speaking of the, the last one of the, of the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch, uh, king, as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in, in the pieces of the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. The day star didn't stay in his lane. The, the one called Lucifer, he rejected the authority of his creator. He rejected the instruction of his creator. There's a passage in 2 Samuel. Let's look at that. Uh, 2 Samuel 22. I'm just read. Just read one verse. I was reading this this week, and it, and it struck me. You know, we think about the, the cherubs, and, and here Satan, uh, Lucifer, was one of, the, one of the covering cherubs at the throne of God, the, the cherubim as, as is represented by the, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant with the lid, the atonement cover lid with the, the two cherubs that cover. Uh, Lucifer was in that role to be in the presence of God, serving at that level. And we see another example of, of some of what the cherubim did. Incredibly powerfully made, beautifully made beings serving God. And there are many faithful ones who, who are, are, are still these, these faithful ones that are still serving God to this day. Uh, but 2 Samuel 22, verse 11. 2 Samuel 22, Verse 11, speaking of God, and oh, let's go to verse 8. Uh, verse 8, then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of heaven quaked. This is, uh, this is a song that David writes uh, near, near the, uh, closer to the end of his days, the words of this song. Uh, but the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Speaking of God, smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode, uh, God himself, uh, he rode up upon the, uh, a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind and made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies from the brightness before him. Coals of fire were kindled. goes on, but uh, the NIV translates this. He parted the heavens and came down. He mounted the carabim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. Think of the role that these, these carab uh, have played uh, down through time. And, and to think that, that this being was in that role, serving, serving God and, and used as powerfully as, as he did. But he forgot what his purpose was. And he, he did not stay in his lane. And, and it's a huge lesson for us uh, to, to, what, to understand what God has given us and what, what his plan is for us, uh, yet at the same time, what can happen if we, if we veer. 
Two passages to wrap this up. Hebrews 12. Scripture talks about, uh, especially in 2 Peter and, and Jude, individuals who down the, down the stretch will, will despise authority to the point that they're even speaking evil of things they don't even really understand, but they despise authority. Are you a person who's, who's willing to be under authority? Am I? Are we, are we willing to place ourselves under the authority? Romans 13 tells us about the authorities of, of this world, of, of the civil authorities, the, the various folks who are in power and they're God's servants uh, in that respect, ministers, ministers of his to do that. Do, do we reject authority? Do we despise authority? Or do we fall in line uh, with authority as long as it doesn't cause us to disobey God? We, we are to recognize authority. Uh, and it's a battle uh, for our young people. It's a battle for, for any of us. It's a battle for the folks who went through some troubling times in the 90s and later and, and saw abuses of authority and found, found themselves coming to the conclusion, I'm never again going to put myself under the authority of a man or under this or that. I'm not going to do that again. I saw what that, that did. I'm not going there. If we are not going there, we are of Satan, the devil. If, we're, if, we're, if we are unwilling to, uh, to consider the authority, God, God sets that up. He sets that up in, in, in our society. He sets that up within the church. We all answer uh, to someone. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verse 28. Hebrews 12, verse 28. He says, in speaking of of this being that we come before. Therefore, since we have re we're receiving a, a kingdom which cannot be shaken, this kingdom that is coming, that is, is part of the destination or the finish line, uh, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. Don't forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, sons, uh, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. We're all in the body. We're all going towards that finish line. We're all racing uh, together. Marriage is honorable among all. Marriage is a beautiful thing that God has given us uh, that we can appreciate deeply. It teaches us so much about life that, that, uh, that uh, Issa and and Aaron are about to uh, be wedded tomorrow. What a wonderful blessing. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators, sexual uh, activity prior to marriage, uh, adulterers, sexual activity outside of marriage, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as we have. Well, of course we should be content. Look what he's giving us. He's giving us everything. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we can boldly, confidently say, the Lord is our helper, uh, my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? So he says, remember those who uh, lead us, who have rule over us. And as we said, we all, we all answer to someone who has spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. So let's conclude with uh, Psalm 102. Psalm 102 as we wrap this up today. We've got to stay in our own lane and we've got to make sure that we're running the right race. We've got to, we've got to understand and, and, and follow and, and come under the authority, uh, the authorities of this world. Pray for those leaders of this world that we might have a peaceable life, that we can, we can do what God has asked us to do, asked of us, and demands that we do in, in being lights to the world and in preaching the gospel. We've got a mission as a church. We've got a mission as the people of God. Uh, and, and in that, we are under the authorities, and we have authority in the church. Each of us must uh, stay in our lanes Psalm 102 wraps this up. Let's uh, conclude with that. Psalm 102, I love this, uh, this psalm as it, as it speaks to the greatness of God, as it speaks to 
encapsulates, encapsulates the, the challenges that many of us face in life, the, the true prize, the source of the prize, and what source and what the source, uh, God the Father and Jesus Christ, own and what they want to give us. Hear my prayer, O Eternal, and let my cry come to you. Don't hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in that day that I call. Answer me speedily, for my days are, are consumed like smoke so fast, so soon. It's, it's the little dot of the pencil head. And my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass so, so that I forget to eat my bread because of the sound of my groaning. My bones cling to my skin. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness, like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and I'm like a sparrow alone on the housetop. My enemies reproach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me for I've eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. And uh, he talks about uh, enduring the indignation of, of God's wrath uh, for, for various reasons. But you, for you've lifted me up and cast me away. My days are like a shadow. They're here, they're gone, and I wither away like grass. But you, O eternal, you, O eternal, you shall endure forever. He has endured forever and will endure forever. And the remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have mercy on Zion, on Mount Zion, that is such a trouble to anyone who tries to contain it and control it. God is coming back to Zion, and he's going to rule, and he'll have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come, for your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. So the nations shall fear the name of the eternal. And all the kings of the earth, your glory. For the eternal shall build up Zion. He shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. This will be written for the generation to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the eternal. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from heaven the eternal viewed the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to release those appointed to death, to, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion, and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples are gathered together in the kingdoms to serve the eternal. He weakened my strength in the way. He shortened my days. I said, oh my God, do not take my, me away from in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish. Even, even that will perish. But, but Father, you will endure. You will continue. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will change them. And they will be changed. But you, you are the same, and your years will have no end. And I love what it says in verse 28. The children of your servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. Brethren, may we run the race. May we run the right race. May we stay in our lane, and may we step into eternity with our Maker who loves us and wants to give us everything.